Mr Juncker has insisted this isn't going to be a summit about Brexit that's happening on Friday. Will they really not be talking about it? Oh, of course they will. Usually when you say that you're not talking about something, then that's what you're going to end up talking about. That's pretty much going to take over, I think, the summit. Then there will be some kind of a process for a future of Europe, because I think Brexit is a tough lesson to learn for all European leaders, and they're trying to suss out what actually happened. How long do you think the Brexit will take? Well, I think it's going to be a long process. You know, we're talking five to ten years. Uh, if you think about the unraveling of the British Empire, that took a very long time. Uh, if you look at EU accession negotiations, that takes a long time. But to try to take yourself out of the EU when you're talking about over 100,000 pages of secondary legislation, over 12,000 pieces of regulation and directives, it just doesn't happen at a snap of a finger. I'm here in London uh, for a week, basically, to try to figure out if Brexit means Brexit, what does Brexit mean? And I don't think anyone really knows. Dan Hannan, five to ten years is not something that happens briefly after Christmas, I guess. No, I mean, it's, it's a process rather than an event. When we get back sovereignty, that's the day that we begin to diverge. On the day we leave, almost all our existing arrangements are still in place. That's when we can start choosing which ones we want to keep and which ones we don't want to keep. And you know, I, I think what we, what we want is the tightest relationship with our European friends in terms of security cooperation, military alliance, open markets compatible with being a fully sovereign country that makes its own laws. But you you wouldn't... A bit like being Canada to the United States. You, you have a, a federation there, you're not part of it, but you're very close to it. You wouldn't disagree with that time frame, though, that it could take about ten years? Well, it will... I mean, Brexit as a legal fact will come into effect when British laws are again supreme in our own territory. And, and there's a time scale there. Once you begin... I mean, it, it, I, I think everyone accepts, as, as Guy Verhofstadt, the negotiator here, put it yesterday, that we could not have another European election in Britain. So Brexit is going to have to come into effect at the latest by the middle of 2019. But of course, at that point, we still have quite a lot of assimilated EU legal acts. And that's the point at which we can start deciding which ones we want to keep. And of course, we should try and do this wherever possible with the consent and approval of our European friends. We, we want to avoid, if we can, acting unilaterally or precipitately. Uh, but, but precipitously is exactly the point, isn't it, Alexander Stubb? Because there are many now within the bloc watching to see what happens with freedom of movement who don't really want it any more themselves. You know that. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the difficult issues. I think one of the big end games with the British negotiations is going to be, on one hand, the internal market, second, linked to that, the free movement of people or immigration, and actually third is going to be the budget, how much, how much all of this costs. Do you think freedom of movement has to break? Quite simply, does that have to go? No, I don't think so. It's one of the fundamental freedoms of the EU. But one of the interesting things is that, and a lot of European leaders are not saying this, remember the UK was one of the only countries to go for true freedom of movement in 2004 when Central and Eastern mm. European countries joined. A lot of the other ones went for transition periods. So this is very much a catch-22 situation, I think, for the other European leaders. Brits did their part, and then they suffered through Brexit. And if you take that on, that freedom of movement will never disappear, then we basically have to acknowledge that we're not going to be part of the single market and that all the ministers that are coming up with various different interpretations are at odds with each other, let alone the rest of the EU. That was to you, Dan. Sorry, Dan. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't see the studio here, Emily. I'm just... Yeah, I mean... Uh, we are, uh, we are going to have access to the single market. Virtually the whole world has access to the single market. You know, if you, if you look at what it says on the back of a smartphone, it says designed in California, manufactured in China. Neither the United States nor China has any trade deal with the EU, but that doesn't mean you can't buy things. So what we're arguing about is not whether we can trade, it's whether we are subject to the same regulatory regime. Mm -hmm. Now, there may be some specific British industries, some specific businesses and sectors where it suits them to be part of the same regime. But, but I would say that for the vast majority, it's better not to have to apply those rules to our domestic commerce and industry or to that growing part of our trade which goes outside the EU. Isn't the problem, though, that uh, even listening to the conversation between David Davis and Theresa May, you understand that no one really understands what the contours of Brexit are and that one comment about the single market is then overturned by another comment about the single market with junior ministers not having a clue which bit they should be backing now? I think it's pretty clear that we will be outside the common external tariff. I mean, the great advantage of Brexit is that we'll be able to have free trade agreements with China, India, Australia. And by the way, this will benefit the rest of the EU. This isn't some competitive process. It's in our interest for the EU to be mm. prosperous. It's in the EU's interest.
Alexander Stubb, do you want Europe to give us concessions? Do you think it is in Europe's interest to help us do this nicely? I think Brexit is a loose-loose uh, proposition, unfortunately, and what we need to avoid is to make it into a loser-loser situation. I think it's in the interest of all of us to make this divorce as amicable as possible. Where I disagree with Daniel there is that I think we are going to have similar rules and regulations. I mean, this is the future. Look at technological advancement. My kids are 14 and 12. Yeah. They're going to be printing their uh, sneakers on uh, 3D printers. Um, there are not going to be rules, trade rules in between. So I, I think this is going to be a very long, cumbersome and difficult process for okay. the UK. We're going to be talking about this next 10 years. <laughs> we look forward to seeing you back here before then, but thank you very much indeed.